War Pugs. Today I'm going to be going into the request list and I'm going to be looking at something that was requested by Casual. And recently I have purged the request list. So a lot of people who have requested the Discord, I have taken those out. I'm going to be going very heavily into the request list in the next couple of weeks. If you would like to see something, would like me to take a look at something, be sure to put it in the request list. Rules, everything like that. Votes, everything like that. Get your votes in on Discord for what you want to see. Now, with all that being said, the five, t the top five creepiest unsolved mysteries in Warhammer 40k. So, normally I go through and I try to guess what some of these are going to be. Um, I always I always try to just give it a shot for myself to see how well me and West Hammer kind of match up on things. Because honestly, West Hammer and I, my knowledge base is more 30k. Like, I know a lot more about 30k than I do modern 40k. And it's primarily because I got wrapped up in the Siege of Terror like a Christmas gift, and I never really got out of it. And the Horus Heresy. And everything else. And the Ragdan Xenocides. And I hate the towel. In any case, guys, this was requested by Casual. And, as you can see behind me, I have a whiteboard. I, I, I've been wanting to get a whiteboard forever, and it sounds so stupid, you guys, but you have no idea how hard it is to keep things together up here in, like, Brain 1. And I'm going to hang it right over there behind where everybody... Well, like, right over here behind the screen. And, um... Yeah. It is a thing, guys. It is something I have been trying to do. Like, I've been wanting to get it for a while now. I didn't have any room in the old place. I have room here. It's up there now. Once I get done painting this wall, which is probably going to be the next thing I paint after I get done back here... And yes, it is taking me days to get done. You see a step ladder over there. I've got to get a whole bunch of stuff taken care of. But I'm steadily working to make this place what I want it to be. I am also trying to get a hold of... Because the one bad thing about... Um, this is I'm having trouble finding a encoder that will work with it. But until I do, once I do have that encoder, I'm going to start putting things together for that on the third channel. Um, it's a rend it's a um, encoder problem that I'm having, just getting things switched over. Well, Warpugs, this is Wes Hammer, and the top five creepy unsolved mysteries. Let's get into it. By the end of this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about five of 40k's creepiest and most obscure mysteries. And this is a franchise that is absolutely chock full of super strange things that have gone unexplained for years or sometimes even decades at a time. True. We're going to be talking about things like an entire hive world's population that suddenly and mysteriously vanished overnight. Yes. And left behind some incredibly bizarre and unexplainable evidence to what had happened. A t are we talking unsolved by the Imperium, or we know what happened, but the Imperium doesn't? Because in that case, I believe he's talking about a certain hive city, a certain hive world, as a matter of fact, that the Drakari took exception to. Terrifying black star that shows up out of nowhere, and everyone who sees it turns into a fanatical, raving cultist. And some super creepy ancient alien devices that grant their wielder mm -hmm. immortality. But eternal life comes at a terrifying price. Yes, it We're does. We're gonna be talking about all that and a whole lot more. But before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. I've got bills to pay, so it's sponsor time. But what do you think it's gonna be? Ray. I'm sure you've seen a million of these segments on YouTube before. Do you think it's gonna be a VPN service, some type of food delivery, some Ray. kind of health supplement? If you said yes to any of those, my friend, I regret to inform you that you are in fact incorrect. It's your boy, Raid Shadow. Thought so. Yes. We I am victorious. <sighs> Raid Shadow Legends. Anyhow. Shadow Legends has taken the mobile gaming world by storm. With I its super in-depth RPG battle system, amazing graphics, intense PvE boss battles, and literally hundreds of unique champions to collect. No matter how many new characters get added to the game, nobody forgets their first champion. And for me, that was my man Gallic. He's an absolute power. He was my first champion too. Carried me through a lot of really tough fights. Granted, I don't play Raid Shadow Legends anymore. 
You know what? I might have to remove that. It's it's making the absolute light of the Sauron even bigger behind my head. I'm just saying. Including a couple of wins in the arena, not to mention helping me absolutely wreck a lot of dungeons. I've unlocked a ton of champions over the last year, but I'll never forget my battles with this guy. And if you didn't know, it's actually Raid's fourth anniversary, and there's a ton to get excited about. I'm talking dedicated offers, free gifts, promo codes, and a brand new fusion event, where you can get your hands on an anniversary-themed legendary champion. You'll also be able to take a trip down memory lane with a recap video of your stats in Raid. Oh yeah, in the next hmm. Amazon Prime drop, it's going to have a ton of powerful gear for the champion Genbo. It'll be available from March 2nd till March 30th, so keep your eyes open. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming to Raid, so if you haven't started playing yet, then now's the perfect time. Use my link in the description, or scan my QR code here on the screen, to get some insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion, Kellen the Shrike, and other useful things like energy refills, magic potions, and XP brews. And since it's Raid's birthday, the gifts keep on coming. Brand new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday Raid. gifts. Once you're in game, Shadow you Legends, on the links, just enter promo code 4 years Raid to get your hands on four legendary skill tomes, plus some other super useful stuff. It'll all be waiting for you right here. Big thanks to Raid for sponsoring this video. Number four. And talking of sponsors and all this other kind of stuff, guys, um, I have recently gotten a hold of this. This is Russian Badgers, and I gotta tell you, it's really good. It's really good, but I'm not eating swamp ass, I'm just saying. Five, Comus, the Tyrant Star. This is a good one. is no stranger to prophecies. Now, whether they be chaotic, xenos, or even human in nature, there are tons of examples of ancient prophecies that foretell a great far-off apocalypse. Mm -hmm. One lesser known of these prophecies speaks of the engulfing darkness that will ultimately devour all of human civilization. It's now, this was made fun of in TTS, but this is actually something that um, there are there are multiple people within the Imperium at higher levels of command that are extremely concerned about this and for really, really good reason. It's detailed in a manuscript the Inquisition refers to as the Prophetica Hereticus Tenebrae. This event is said to be heralded by all manner of signs that will gradually transmute human minds and make them ready to embrace eternal darkness. The origin of the prophecy is currently a mystery to us as the audience, mm -hmm. as it is said to be held within the Bastion Serpentis archives, and none but Lord Inquisitor Zerbe are permitted to study it. The Inquisition has a lot of different theories on the nature of this prophecy, some claiming that it is clearly chaotic in nature, it is. whereas others point out that the word devour shows up pretty often in the text. We don't know what species pinned this prophecy, but if it was the Eldar, then the word devour is used by them pretty frequently in reference to the Tyranids. Comus itself is said to be either a black sun or a halo of black flame, a herald of the encroaching darkness, represented in the text itself by, as of this moment, an unknown rune that bears a striking resemblance to the clawed foot of a bird. The symbol has never been seen in any other text, so we don't really know its origins. On one hand, we might be able to write this off as a spooky prophecy from some unknown ancient Xeno species True. that all but certainly has gone extinct. But not so fast, as the Kalexa sector has been plagued by a bizarre reoccurring phenomena over the last century. A monstrous black sun, matching the descriptions in the text, suddenly and mysteriously appearing out of nowhere in various locations throughout the sector. No two appearances have ever been quite the same, but there are definitely discernible patterns that link them all together. In most cases, a ghostly star emanating black flames and esoteric unknown radiations spontaneously materializes within a planetary system. The thing shines malevolently for a few days and then mysteriously vanishes without a trace. And the thing about it is, it also has no gravitation to it. So this is, the chances of it being an actual star are next to none because of travel, it's everything else like this. It also doesn't appear near warp storms. So whatever this thing is, it's most, it's most likely Xenos in origin. We just don't know who built it, built the thing. And it's most definitely chaotic. Sometimes the black star appears alongside a planet's normal one, and sometimes it eclipses it entirely. 
The phenomena has been documented at least 18 times, but it's believed to have occurred far more than that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the sun showing up in far more subtle ways, like in the reflection of a wine glass, or only visible at night as a dark spot that's blacker than the night sky itself. Mm -hmm. The Tyrantine Cabal of the Inquisition firmly believes that the spectral sun phenomena is without a doubt the tyrant star Comos mentioned in the prophecy, as it very closely matches its description. However, there are some competing theories on what this thing actually is. Some say that it is a ghostly image of a stellar body within the immaterium trying to shine through the fabric of real space. In a similar vein, some say the star is within the warp itself and is partially translating into the physical universe, as if it is trying to find a way through. There are others still, even within the Inquisition, that claim that it is a Xenos artificial construct, a weapon of unknown origins that is incomprehensible to mankind. Whatever its origins, every single time the star appears, its visitation has caused public unrest and geological instability. For months before it shows up, a planet will experience unnatural earthquakes and volcanic upsurges. The social fabric of the world will begin to deteriorate as a psychic madness infects the planet's population. There will be uncontrolled rioting, looting, and uprisings of dozens if not hundreds of distinct fanatical cults. It's always Multitudes fun. more psychers will either be born or become active during this time, and mutation will run rampant throughout society. The signs of the star's coming will be widespread, taking the form of bizarre yet identical birthmarks appearing on newborns, mm -hmm. and odd runic symbols appearing on walls without explanation. The population will begin to see the sun itself in their nightmares, and will even be haunted by unexplained visions of the sun's reflection in mirrors, pools, and puddles. If the Inquisition is to be believed, then after the sun disappears, many of these worlds will eventually return to business as normal. The strange celestial phenomenon bearing no connection to any of the events the planet had to endure. However, the Inquisition seems determined to track each one of these visitations, and has worked tirelessly to carefully suppress any official confirmation of the sun's existence. Only time will tell if the tyrant star really is the herald of humanity's downfall, or just another instance of unexplained phenomena. No I am more... Honestly, I am... I. The Howling. Oh god, The Howling's next. I love this. I love this so far. I am more of the mind that it is a Xenos device, kind of similar to the ne how the Necrons have the Pharos. This is just a larger, more powerful version of a device like that. Um, I do not, n like, I have not really heavily going into it but there's mentions of it all over the place number four the howling throughout 40k's extensive lore we find little snippets here and there that show us just how horrifying the galaxy really is mm -hmm. there are creatures that lurk in the dark places between stars that are not only ludicrously powerful but also horrifically malevolent in their intent yes. the truly baffling thing to me as a 40k fan is that many of these documented sightings of such terrifying entities often equate to little more than a footnote in the Imperium's history. This is true. Some of the worst things that happened, some of, because it's a matter of threat level. It's always a matter of threat level. And when something, for the Imperium, if there was something horrifying that happened, but then it, like, went away, nobody's going to care about it that much after the fact. Nobody's going to sit there and dedicate a lot of time and resources to some random event that happened and then went away. They just simply don't have the resources to dedicate to these things. So the more pressing threats are always focused on, and events like this are just kind of swept underneath the rug. Like, okay, if it, it went away, as long as, this, as long as it's not making any more noise, maybe we can ignore it a little while longer. An obscure piece of lore that is given little to no attention. One such instance was known as the Howling, mm -hmm. where an alien cyborg psyker of unknown origin, known only as the Cacodominus, demonstrated ludicrously powerful and manipulative psychic abilities. It was able to exert complete and utter control over every living thing in a massive area that contained around 1300 planetary systems. This would make it one of the most powerful psychic entities we have ever witnessed within the physical universe. Yes. What sinister purpose it had for dominating the minds of the untold billions of these worlds is currently unknown. 
But its reign of domination would inevitably come to an end when it was slain by the Black Templars in the 34th millennium. Its vengeance would come in the form of an immense psychic backlash, an alien scream that reverberated through the warp, growing in power with every subsequent echo. This creature's psychic death scream was so powerful that it managed to burn out the minds of a billion astropaths within its blast radius, and not to mention distort the signal of the Astronomicon itself all the way back on Terra. Mm -hmm. Millions upon millions of ships were lost in the resulting chaos, and it was said that entire subsectors were completely taken over by rampant barbarism as their societies descended into madness without the wisdom of the Adeptus Terra to guide them. In my research, I've only been able to find a handful of mentions of this event. The first coming from the 5th edition 40k rulebook, and the second coming from the 8th edition Space Marines Codex. Other than that, we're really not given a lot more insight into it. What exactly was this thing? Was it a one-off creation, a freak abnormality, or a harbinger of a viciously powerful yet undocumented Xeno species? The idea that there could be more of these things out there is truly terrifying to think of. The legend of the Cacodominus does live on through the Black Templars, as they kept its skull as a relic. <laughs> and if you're a player of the Warhammer 40k tabletop game, you can actually take this relic on one of your Black Templar characters. It confers a stacking negative aura to psychic tests, and makes enemy psychers far more likely to suffer perils of the warp, which I thought was pretty neat. Hopefully, yeah, just let it, just let the, just let the elder have it. You know, just let him have it. Just throw it at a craft world. They'll love it. This is a plotline that Games Workshop decides to revisit sometime in the future. Hmm. Number three, the disappearance of Fornax Olive. Fornax Olive was the site of one of the most unnerving and inexplicable episodes within the Sabbat World's mm. Crusade. The yes. High World had been determined to be an enemy bastion, one that had a significant fleet reserve and would put up an enormous fight. Nine regiments of the Imperial Guard were set to invade the planet, and it was planned that they would be reinforced by the Iron Snake Space Marine chapter. However, the assault ended up getting delayed twice because of aggressive warp storm activity in the area. Now, these warp storms were so bad that the Iron Snake's battle barges were forced into a four-month holding pattern. Mm -hmm. General Elbeth, serving under Warmaster Slato, was set to command the Imperial Guard units, but his fleets ended up getting scattered by the warp storms, and when he arrived at the planet, he did so with only a third of his complement. To make happens. matters worse, there was no sign of the Iron Snakes that were supposed to be there to support them. Now, Elbeth was a very cautious man and decided to abort the assault run. The forces he had under his control were certainly nothing to scoff at, no. but they wouldn't be enough to take an entire hive world single-handedly. And this right here is something that you see in 40k. It's, it's one of the things I really like. You do have some idiot commanders that would sit there and plow ahead because the bureaucratic, the bureaucratic nightmare that is the Imperium cannot contain all idiots, but at the same time, you do have decent commanders who will sit there and look. Could he have gone in there and done some major major work? Yes. Could he have achieved space superiority? Almost oh, definitely. But would it make sense to, you know, show his hand and allow the people on the planet to fortify just to make the taking of it by the guard that much harder? No. He moved his fleets to the outer system and decided to hold there until reinforcements arrived. Good man. That being said, he didn't want to waste this opportunity, so he directed a rapid pursuit frigate, the Ziegler, to undertake an intruder pass through the inner system. This would be done to assess the enemy's strengths and disposition. Very good However, man. to the general's complete bafflement, the Ziegler encountered zero resistance, and no orbital batteries fired on it, and no ships were launched to engage. The Ziegler even reported that all of the orbital yards were entirely empty of ships, both military and civilian. Most peculiar of all, they detected no electromagnetic activity anywhere on the planet. No Vox substrate, no power industry, no motion of any kind. The great On a hive world, this is referred to as an issue. Great hives of Fornex Aleph appeared to be empty and dead. General Elbeth believed that maybe the population had retreated to the countryside, so over the next several weeks, he would deploy many more cruisers to scout out different parts of the planet. All of them, however, came up empty. There was no life that could be detected anywhere on the planet. Elbeth decided to launch a spearhead force instead of waiting for reinforcements, deploying two full regiments of heavy infantry, mm -hmm. the 34th and 52nd Fighting Felids. He would also deploy the Vitrian 10th Armored Brigade, which totaled to about 16,000 men and women in 800 fighting vehicles. Much like what happened with the Rapid Pursuit frigates, they met no resistance. The world was entirely devoid of life. It was as if the vast population had suddenly vanished in an instant. 
There were half-eaten meals on hab tables, Ooh. unfinished games of regicide in the street parlors. There wasn't even power, but that was admittedly easily restored, showing no indication of sabotage. If the planet had been evacuated, there would surely be unmistakable evidence of this. And if a great plague had taken the population, there would be bodies everywhere. Yes. There were, however, no corpses to be found, no burial pits or any sign of struggle or disaster. The entire population had disappeared without explanation, leaving behind an eerie, vacant world. Unfortunately, the only thing we really have to go on is the transcribed reports that Elbeth gave back to Warmaster Slato. And those reports indicate that him and the men under his control were incredibly unnerved. Oh, yeah. Despite the uneasiness they felt, they ended up fortifying their position. The war crime cat is in here. One second, war bugs. Position ...to wait for reinforcements. The men were getting more and more nervous each and every day. And during the night, they would report the sound of bone-chilling screams of anguish mm -hmm. echoing throughout the hive. Despite search efforts, the source of the screaming was never located. On the first day of 758 M41, all transmissions from Elbis Liberation Force abruptly ceased. It would be 80 more days after this when the Iron Snakes, who had been delayed by the warp storms, would finally arrive as reinforcements. 300 of them immediately made planetfall and made their way to Elbis's last recorded position. It was said that the Iron Snakes were a very serious chapter that were not easily disturbed, mm -hmm. but their initial contact back to the Warmaster Slido lacked their characteristic demeanor. They seemed to be at a loss for words, their report only saying that there was no one here. There was no evidence that Elbeth and his forces had ever been there. If they had fortified a position, it could not be located. Whatever happened to the planet's population had claimed Elbeth and the men and women under his command as well. The Iron Snakes would spend the next month scouring every single inch of the world for clues to what had happened. For the most part, their search came up disappointingly empty, with one exception. Impossibly, a single yes, Lumen Rust yes. battle tank was discovered 80 stories up on the roof of a hab stack. All of the Vox headsets inside were missing, except for the last 30 centimeters of their cords that had been plugged into the outlets. The cords themselves had been severed and somehow fused at a molecular level. The only human remains that were discovered was a single gauntlet in which a calcified human hand was found still gripping the gearbox lever within the tank. No <laughs> formal explanation of what happened on this world was ever established, and years later the planet would be repopulated. Now thankfully since then there have been no mysterious mass disappearances or anything like that. But to this day, the population has continued to report unexplained screams in the dead of night. Now... <clears throat> That being said, that being said, this is not the only time, this is not the only time a planet's population has simply vanished without a trace. Um, <laughs> it's happened before, but we know who did it. Um, basically what wound up happening is a hive world pissed off the dark Eldar, uh, with the Drukhari. And pissed them off enough to where a uh, homunculi brought his um brought something that is lovingly referred to as a carnival of pain. And when the Imperium came by, they found no sign whatsoever a battle had been waged there. The entire population was gone. There was no life on the planet. It had been rendered entirely sterile by <laughs> and the thing about it is nobody knows what happened. Except the Drakari, and they aren't talking. But a lot of them do have fold-up souls now. They really have those fold-up souls now because of my... G I think the Hive was called Auxilian. Um, yeah, don't make deals with Eldar Corsairs. It doesn't usually go your way. <laughs> and you're a traitor. <laughs> Anyhow, I'll be right back. Oh my god. Can you, for one second, imagine the amount of effort it would take to get somebody to go to one of those two planets? Just the amount of effort it would take to get somebody to go to those two planets to repopulate them willingly. Like, what would you have to offer them? Hey, buddy, look, got this world for you. Nobody's there yet. <laughs> Everybody knows that's a lie. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Oh, the Labyrinth of Thanotep. Number two, the Labyrinth of Thanotep. 
The labyrinth of Thanotep is a tesseract labyrinth the size of an entire planet. Now, this infinite prison trammels in being so terrible that not even the Necrons dare to enslave them for war. What I just read to you is literally all the information on the labyrinth that exists. It was only ever mentioned briefly within the 9th edition Necron Codex, mm -hmm. and then subsequently, never even so much as referenced again. So our imaginations are kind of allowed to run wild with this one. Now, I just want to put it into perspective. Out of all of the terrifying things contained within the labyrinth, the Necrons have deemed them too dangerous to be enslaved for war. This is a faction that literally did just that to their gods. True. And turning against the Catan, shattering them into dozens of fragments, and then subsequently enslaving those fragments and throwing them out on the battlefield like Pokemon. The only difference between the Catan shards and Pokemon is the Catan have the devastating power to completely sunder reality. Yet, whatever lurks within the depths of the labyrinth has these god killers spooked out of their robot minds. The idea that there could be entities out there far older than the Catan, which are said to be as old as the universe itself, and vastly more powerful than them or even the Chaos Gods is not that unheard of. True. As in the novel Godblight, there's an instance where an Eldari Farseer is talking of the Catan. He calls them the gods of the Materium, and that there are other, more ancient, and even more terrible things out there. Whatever the Eldar was referring to may very well be what the Necrons have contained within the Labyrinth, but that's just me speculating. We really don't have a lot to go on. On yet with a lot of the 40k mysteries that exist we're simply put what the necrons have in there are rust monsters from D, D. that's what they have in there able to piece together little bits of information from across decades of contributions to the lore now whether they take the form of full-fledged novels campaign books codexes white dwarfs or even the various video games and audio dramas that have been released by piecing all this together we can slowly work our way towards an answer a lot of the time, however, something will be mentioned briefly and then not acknowledged again by the authors for years or mm -hmm. perhaps even decades until they decide they're ready to expand upon it. In a little bit more of a meta contextual analysis of 40k literature, I think that's what we're seeing with The Labyrinth. Since its first mention was only a few years ago, I feel like it's something that's being set up for a future expansion, but only time will tell if Games Workshop wants to give us any more information on this admittedly cool and spooky place. Press X to doubt. Number one the Halo devices. The Milky Way galaxy is impossibly ancient, and from the time of its inception, countless different civilizations have risen and fallen. Most of the species that saw themselves as the would-be inheritors of all of creation ended up falling short and were confined to the halls of extinction. Their great empires succumbing to entropy, every piece of evidence that they had ever even existed eventually crumbling to dust. Mm -hmm. For some species, however, their great work endured long after the echoes of their existence returned to nothingness. Sometimes these took the form of ancient alien ruins that denied the passage of time and stood defiantly for millions of years. And most of them serve as a superficial reminder that nothing lasts forever, whereas others seem to have been designed with a synthetic malevolence. Perilous devices of inhuman knowledge and unknown purpose that concede corruption, twist the soul, befoul the mind, and profane the sacred human form. One such artifact is what is known by the rogue traders and the Inquisition as the Halo Devices. Incredibly dangerous constructs of unknown alien origin that have been long forbidden to mankind. Despite the terrifying and dark nature of these constructs, and many would still seek them out for the false gifts they promise. It doesn't matter what terrifying price they demand, as they offer something that all of humanity has craved since we first crawled our way out of the primordial ooze. Immortality. They now here's the thing. I do not know, I know next to Jack about the Halo devices, so this is me learning something. The Halo device gets its name from the region of space known as the Halo Stars where they were first discovered. And between the Halo Stars and the Ghoul Stars, I can't picture a worse set of places for you to be. Like, it's a toss up between the two in my, in my book. Personally, I'd rather go to the Halo Stars than the Ghoul Stars, but that's just me. Because the Ragdan aren't there weren't there, just saying. They were found on lifeless alien worlds that orbited dead stars, some resembling smooth talismans, while others are orbs filled with an unknown fluid. There was even one reported case of a halo device that resembled a living worm-like creature. All of them are glossy and smooth to the touch and defy analysis by auspex scanners. 
They are impervious to harm, and despite their impossible age, show no evidence that time has any effect on them. It's generally agreed upon that the worlds in which the devices were found were once part of a great and ancient civilization. But as they left nothing but the devices behind, we really don't know much about them and perhaps never will. Mm -hmm. When one of these devices bonds with a human, it will increase their strength, knowledge, and reaction time exponentially. They will be granted youth, vigor, and undying power. But what makes them so horrifying is that this all comes at a terrifying cost. You see, the device will end up possessing their body and mind, twisting their thoughts towards strange, deranged thirst. Over time, their life becomes not their own, being completely dominated by the device, like a sick puppet of flesh. That's Whether sick. or not the disturbing effects the Halo devices seem to have on human beings was by design or simply a byproduct of them integrating with a biological species they were never designed to, is still unknown. If these morbid effects were intentional, then it would indicate that the creators had an evil, callous genius that would put even the homunculi of the Dark Eldar to shame. There was one recorded instance of a Halo device being used by the head of a powerful mercantile house. A Lord Inquisitor would deem the heretic so reviled that his name and all accounts of his deeds were to be expunged from Imperial records. I when he was discovered, he one. had become a grotesque fusion of polluted human flesh and Xenos artifacts, the later becoming so much part of him that it was impossible to tell where one began and the other ended. He was said to be possessed of unnatural powers and could not die. Now, we don't know much about what exactly he was capable of, but it was said that his sins were so grievous and disturbing to the Inquisition that they ordered the execution of not just him, but of every living person within his house and all of the house's vassals as well. They were so afraid yep. of this guy that his execution came in the form of him literally being thrown into the planetary system's sun. The transformation induced by a Halo device becomes more pronounced over time and can be separated into three distinct phases. Okay. It takes a few weeks for the device to fully bond with its user's flesh, and after that point, there is no way to remove it without killing the host. Their form will rejuvenate to the peak of youth and health. Any physical diseases, deformities, or mutations will be negated, and any part of the body that had been lost, like a severed limb, will miraculously regrow. As their physical body begins to grow more powerful, their mind will start to degrade. At first, they'll realize that they no longer find pleasure in normal sensory stimuli. As they lose their sense of smell and food will begin to taste like ash in their mouth. The host will begin to suffer violent mood swings, and as time progresses, they will find that they no longer require a full night's rest, only a few hours of sleep every couple of weeks, Ugh. in which they will be haunted by terrifying alien dreams of strange dead cities beneath dark stars. Phase Concern. 2 happens after a period of a couple of years, where the device will have fully implemented itself into the host's body, no. becoming partially absorbed at a cellular level. The point on their body where the device originally made contact will have been healed over by new skin. The initial bonding location will twist with hardening scar tissue, resembling something like a tough exoskeleton of an insect. By this point, the host's muscular and skeletal systems will have twisted in such a way that they are inhumanly fast, strong, and resilient. They no longer sleep at all, eat or drink normal food. But as their mind descends further into the Halo device's synthetic madness, they will begin to develop strange addictions and insatiable hungers. Nope. In order to keep up their appearance and strength, these hungers will have to be regularly indulged, or they will begin to grow increasingly unstable and sickly. These addictions can come in the form of spending long isolated periods in total darkness, or immersion in solar radiation. Their hunger can take a lot of different forms, but most commonly, it comes in the need to feast on human flesh, of course. the drinking of blood and cranial fluids. Their minds will further contort to the point where their memories begin to be replaced with those of things they have never witnessed, such as strange alien civilizations, insights into heretical lore, and unknown languages. There are even some reports that if a person at this phase ends up getting killed, but their body was not completely destroyed at the cellular level, they over time will resurrect as they begin to stitch themselves So they become Deadpool. This is not a good sign. Back together. In the few instances this was documented, the individual was driven into full-blown insanity. Phase three occurs after a host has been in contact with the device over multiple decades. At this point, there is no longer any separation between the user and the Halo device. They still resemble a humanoid, but their humanity has been completely stripped away. Now, documented individuals that have proceeded to this stage are noted as having a corpse-like flesh, burning eyes, distorted gaunt features, armor-like hides, and even fingers that have fused into long talons of exposed bone. 
Their Lovely. strength will have advanced to the point where the host can rip a full-grown man's head clean from their shoulders with barely any effort. A host in Phase 3 is said to be able to survive the void of space and can regenerate from death remarkably quickly. Their mind that had once been bordering the whirlpool of madness has now completely descended into insanity. Great. It is no longer the mind of a singular entity, but an unholy union of deranged intellects. If a rogue trader was so inclined to seek these devices out and sell them under the counter, each one would fetch an absolutely exorbitant price, as the rumors of these devices mostly begin and end with the promise of eternal youth right. due to the Inquisition's relentless efforts to cover up their existence. If he would, I wouldn't try to cover these up. I'd be letting people know exactly what they're going to get. Go ahead, find out. Be buyer does know anything of their more terrifying side effects. They may view this as a price worth paying. However, the trade Why? of these things is not only utterly illegal, but an unforgivable heresy. The Inquisition views the Halo devices as an immediate threat to the Imperium's stability and thus has declared war on them and anyone who has ever even remotely come into contact with the blasphemous alien technology. They constantly scour the Kalexis sector for any rogue traders that would attempt to secure them or sell them in underground markets. Anyone found to have come into contact with a Halo device will be eradicated without mercy. Mm -hmm. As the years go by, more and more of these devices are unearthed, and how many of them are currently out there in circulation is currently unknown. But considering the Inquisition has so far been unsuccessful at containing their plague of madness, it seems like an undeniable conclusion that they will eventually spread throughout the entirety of the Imperium, uh. and the amount of damage they'll be able to do is incalculable. And that was five of the creepiest and most obscure 40k mysteries. Which one was your favorite? Which one did you find the spookiest? Is there anything else you found in this franchise that you find super creepy and you'd love to hear me talk about it? Then let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. This if you've good. been watching my channel for a while, then you this know that I good. genuinely read just about everything y'all post. This and good. one of my favorite things to do is to hang out in the comment section and nerd out about 40k with y'all. If you've made it this far in the video and you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, then wh what are you even doing? Come on, come on and join the Wes Hammer party. I'm going to be posting a lot more cool stuff like this and I don't want you to miss out on it. And while you're at it, Go ahead and roll the charge that like button. Big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one. <sighs> War pugs, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. If you're in 40k, don't mess with anything. Leave everything alone. Don't touch anything. If you don't know what it is, leave it be. If Sandy Ike starts acting strange, that's a problem. 40k is such a dystopian nightmare. It just beggars belief. But I, my personal favorite out of the five that he discussed has got to be 100% Fornix Elf. Okay? Something like that would legitimately creep me out past, like, when I first read the story of Auxilian, I was like, my god. Just, just, no, 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 leave it be. I abort mission, get back on the transports, whatever happened here, I don't want to find out. I don't want to know. I don't need to know. I'm leaving now. I think I would do okay. I honestly think if I was, if I lived in the Imperium, if I 100% lived in the Imperium, hopefully, if I was in a position where I had some measure of wealth, where I wasn't sitting there a regular hive, a regular person in a hive, the last thing on my mind to do at any one point would be to go investigate anything. I am not Scooby Doo in the gang. I'm leaving it well the hell alone. Because I don't know what in the hell it's going to do to me. <sighs> That's what 40k is so great at. We, as... We're barely out of the trees. In terms of evolutionary. Um, and so, one of the things that... Um, the fear of the unknown is such a big deal for us. But it's a fear that we developed... Because anything we didn't know about could potentially kill us. And that's 40k in a nutshell. Warpugs, Wes Hammer. Guys, 
If you haven't subscribed to West Hammer, that is a good question. Why haven't you yet? If you haven't subscribed to me, you're hurting my feelings. Guys, I'm going to head out from here. I don't know if I'm going to get any painting done tonight, but um, we'll see. And as far as everything else goes, guys, if you would like to request something, check out the Discord. The request channel is open in the Discord. Uh, check out Patreon. Check out channel memberships. All that kind of good stuff. I'm going to head up out of here because my nose just started itching and my eye is twitching. And I will catch you, Warpugs, next time. Uh, just say no to showing up to a ghost town.